Hello brothers and sisters and welcome back to an all new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend Jamie McCaskill. I want to take this time once again to thank you all for joining me here like I do each and every week. It's always such a lovely, lovely thing to be able to be here with all of you. Um, just to let you all know, Jennifer's home. She's out of that. Uh, she's out of St. Francis and back home with me and the boys. And we had a party to, uh, yesterday for her. So yeah, it's a great, great thing. So I'm going to bow our heads and thank our Heavenly Father for all the gifts that He's given us. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us, all the small things. You always give us such great and wonderful gifts, and we don't even take the time sometimes to recognize them. And I'd like to take that time now, Father, to thank you. You know, you, you, you work on us on a molecular level. You heal us for, You heal us of things. As a song that I like to listen to, Father, that I, I, I feel really screams that out, and she says that you're moving mountains that we don't even see. You're parting waters before we get there so we can pass through. And we thank you for that. You're, you're, you're amazing and wonderful and we love you for it. And we thank you, Father, for, for just the gift of life. You, you gave us that. You give us life. You give us air to breathe, food to, food to eat, water to drink. And you, you give us these things before you even created us. And that's just amazing. And we thank you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, today, we're continuing on these little, uh, what, I, what I'm calling, standalone sermons. Which are just little, you know, subjects that we're going to talk about. And today, we're going to talk about apostasy. Uh, or um, various cults and religions. And, you know, the ones that have departed from the truth. Now, what is apostasy. If you were to look up apostasy, what you will see is that it literally translates to falling away, you know, forsaking or departing from the faith. Let's take a look here at at this time at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Give you a moment to get there while I get there myself. Okay, so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, sorry, my, this uh, little Bible app sometimes likes to act up. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we read, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, what Paul is t telling us here is that there are certain things that, that have to happen before the coming of the Antichrist. And one of these things that he warns us about is that there would first be what he calls the great apostasy. You see, the word apostasy comes from a Greek word, and that word is apostasia, which, like I said, means to defect or to forsake the faith. Just like we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, one of the things that I see when I look around, and, and it honestly it does sadden me, is that the current generation that we live in, they have set the standard for apostasy. Now, sure, sure, you, you can say that there have always been these uh, heretical views, just like there have always been things like earthquakes, like famine, war, am I right? But you see, this generation, they have elevated apostasy to an art form. Now, let me ask you this. What would you think if one day you were sitting in a church, okay, 
And up on stage walks this Episcopal bishop, and he champions things like, um, I don't know, that the resurrection of Jesus never happened. That it was a legend or, or a myth. Or that there never was an empty tomb. That there, were, there was no angel sitting there. And in fact, not only that, Jesus did not appear to anyone after that happened. Not only that, okay, but that no one who has reasonable, who was reasonable, I should say, would ever believe that the Bible was intended to be taken literally. That the things like, you know, the virgin birth, uh, Bethlehem, the manger, all of these things, they need to go away. That the church should endorse homosexual activity and premarital sex. Not only endorse it, but celebrate it. Well, what if I told you that actually happened? An Episcopal bishop from Newark, New Jersey, named John Sprong, happily promoted all of these things in his books. He said that the idea that shaped the New Testament... These ideas that shaped it were outdated, that they needed to be discarded if the Christians were to ever survive today. Well, let me read you a review <laughs> that I found on Amazon for one of his books. It read, Oddly enough, Spong's view do not seem new. In fact, his views seem very much in keeping with the religious humanist variety of Unitarianism. So yeah, the belief themselves are not remarkable. What is remarkable to me is that this was an Episcopal bishop and he's embracing these things. You know, the Apostle John, he predicted that there will be a time when men and women will depart from the true faith. That they will embrace heresy. Look what he told the young church in Thessalonia. You'll read this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or later supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. What he's trying to tell them is that before the Lord will return, <coughs> before the Antichrist comes, there will be this rebellion or, or this departing. All right, and, and this is apostasy. Okay, The prophecy plainly said, that before Jesus returns, many who, who trusted the truth are going to depart from it. The way that I take it uh, as a, a preacher, you know, that even preachers will depart from the Word of God that is given to us in the Bible. Now, what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, let's go ahead and read that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise up first. So after this catching away, or if you prefer the rapture, all right, all of those who were with Jesus or I should say, were in Jesus, they will be gone. Okay. The verse reads, Then they who are alive shall be caught up together in the clouds with them who remain to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. Now, this means that the time will be ripe for people who, who, who claim to be a Christian, but are not. So they'll be able to turn their backs on God and what they do, as well as, you know, what they thought. Their insecurities, you know, all of those insecurities, they'll be, they will demonstrate themselves outwardly. They're going to show it, okay? 
the anti-God movement will then become universal. We can find another verse that speaks of the same departing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. Oh, wrong one. That must have been 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> Verses 1 and 2. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you be by the Lord, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk to please God, so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you from the Lord Jesus. For the time will come when men will... You know, see, I, I must have wrote... That's first Timothy, Second Timothy, I'm sorry. Let's go look at that. I wrote the verse down wrong. <laughs> Verses 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Alright? Now, then we read it, that it says, Now the Spirit of expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy having their own conscience seared with a hot iron I must have wrote that down wrong that must have been 1 Timothy I'm having a bad day with that aren't I Yeah, that's 1 Timothy. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I wrote it down as 2 Timothy. Anyway, as well as also in uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their you know, itching of ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. Then we read in about the seven churches in Revelations. I did a whole series on that, right? Especially in chapters 2 and 3. We read about Laodicea. It shows us what the church will, will be like right before the rapture. Let us read the Lord, what the Lord says about the apostate churches. Go ahead. Revelations chapter 3. We're going to read verses 15 to 18. writing down the wrong verses a lot <laughs> I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot I would thou I wish thou wert cold or hot so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see okay so where am I at on here I'm my notes are all jambled I'm sorry now I want you to honestly think when I ask this, all right, I want you to honestly put just put this in your mind and just kind of think on this for a moment. Does the current church look and smell like the church of Laodicea? One of the authors I like to read, his name is Tim LaHaye. I read his stuff all the time. He says that he believes that the church that we have today is in the same trouble that is described by Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 and 23 where it reads many will say to me on that day Lord Lord did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles and I will say to them plainly I never knew you away from me you evildoers we just talked about that last week remember now some could say right that the church has always been plagued by apostasy but what I'm going to tell you once again not like it is today okay the Bible makes it very clear that doctrinal 
confusion will rise in these later days. And it will actually lead to a departing from the faith as people begin to follow these deceiving spirits, to adopt these doctrines of demons. I see it daily on YouTube ads where some videos say things like the old ways were right. Can you deny that false religions and cults have grown out of lies or apostate branches of the church? Throughout the centuries there have been theological errors that have crept in and just like the book, just like we read in the book of Judges, we just finished that, how God would rise up judges. God has raised up reformers who have called his people back to foundational doctrines of Scripture. Sometimes he has raised up people who, who have led movements that actually separate them according to the scriptures. This is why we have so many denominations. In the 19th century, there was actually an individual who was educated in Europe. Listen to me when I tell you this. He was influenced by German, what they called rationalism. He began to teach in seminaries. That's right. In seminaries where, where a lot of churches decided that minister had to go to seminary before he could preach. The devil knows how he can inject his own doctrine into the church. Here we see that he did it by infiltrating the seminaries. That way... He can indoctrinate these young ministers who will then go into a church and spread things that are false, false concepts all across the world. Tim LaHaye talked of a seminary professor, this man is now deceased, who for over 25 years occupied what is known as the Chair of Christian Ethics. And what, what is actually, the I'm not going to say its name, but it's one of the largest seminaries here in the United States. This man helped to orient the thinking of thousands of ministers in our current generation. Several years ago, it was actually discovered that this man was a member of the Communist Party. Think about that. It makes it clear why we have these denominations that are radical and unbelieving, doesn't it? Then you have this rise in what uh, some like to call one world religion. Now, as much as I loved Pope John Paul II, and as much as I agree with his stance on things like abortion and um, you know, other aspects of morality, you have to oppose one thing that he promoted. He promoted unity with these other religions. These religions that, that deny Christ. Now, this is not talking about as, this is not talked about, I should say, as often as I believe it should be. But in 1986, he convened a conference. You can read all about this. Look it up online. He convened a conference for over 130 religious leaders in Assis, Italy, to do, as he put it, pray for world peace. In attendance, there were, uh, there were Muslims, there were Buddhists, there were Hindus, there were pantheists, the Dalai Lama, and many, many, many others who reject Jesus. Who could they be praying to? I mean, think about it. They do not agree on who or even what God is. Or even in whose name they should pray. One thing is certain, though. And that is that you cannot reject or ignore Jesus, who is the Son of God, and expect to have your prayers answered. Speaking of pantheists, 
Most people have a deep need to belong to a community. And this is most likely why so many people join or, or stick with a religion that they actually doubt in secret. The word, the world pantheist movement aims to provide a spiritual and a social home base for people who love nature, who love the universe, but they do not believe in a supernatural entity. The home base provides a com provides what is known as community support of a local group, okay? It facilitates them. It helps them to celebrate natural weddings and funerals and uh, any other special occasion in the style that people want. The believers can go there. They can share their, their own beliefs, their enthusiasm, without being afraid of being ostracized or, or considered an outsider. Now, to the human ear, this sounds like a good thing. It, it tickles our ears, you might say. Makes you feel good. But the Bible makes it clear that the idea that all religions point to the same God is blasphemous. As well as the idea <coughs> that there are many ways to God. Buddha, Mary, Gawa, Muhammad. None of these are the same as Jesus. They do not carry the same weight with the triune God of the Bible. There is only one, only one begotten Son, and only He can give you or me access to God through prayer. So, how close are we? Well, all it would take for all of the world's religions to unite under the leadership of, of Rome would be the rapture of true Christians. It would strip the Catholic Church. It would strip the Orthodox Church. It would strip the liberal Protestants. And yes, even you and me, us evangelicals, of all of the true believers. It would make religious unity without respect of the differences instantly possible. Now, I want you to think about the world around you. How many times do we hear about <laughs> religious tolerance? Well, have you ever noticed that the only religious group that is not tolerated today are Bible-believing Christians? We are seen as intolerant. Why? Because we insist that Jesus is the only way. <clears throat> Once we are taken away by the rapture, there's nothing that will impede these idol worshippers. The ones who want to unite and become the horror Babylon that has been drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You know, what we read about in Revelation 17.6. Revelations makes it clear that these idolaters, they will continue to hate Jesus and his followers all the way into the tribulation. I believe that the stage is set for the resurrection of this you know, great occultic religious system. That is based on John's prophecy, on, on the evidence that I see just by looking around in the world today. We know that Eastern culture has always been open to the occult, but today, today in our modern Western society, we're seeing a great fascination with black arts and with dark religions. You know what really threw me for a loop? Look at how the occult is so prevalent in the lives of our children, the future leaders. I sat at the table eating Thanksgiving dinner with my wife's, with my wife's family one day, and uh, I actually this has been a long time ago. <laughs> I don't even remember how long ago it was, but I remember I remember this because I heard my little niece singing a song, 
that included the words, Hail, O Goddess. I looked up and I asked about it, you know, only to have my mother-in-law say it was a song from some kid's show. Pay attention to what your kids are watching. Pay attention to what they're reading because it's not just the children. There's a whole generation that grew up in the 60s who have been brainwashed with anti-biblical worldviews. We see that the church is being targeted, targeted for conversion by pagans. Do some research. You'll discover a group. This group is called the Temple of Understanding, who, who is actually affiliated with what they call the Gaia Institute and the UN Global Committee of Parliamentarians on Public Development. They're behind a, a push to overrun Christian churches with nature-worshipping propaganda. You call me a call me a conspiracy theorist if you want. The effort is organized under the auspices of the National Religious Partnership for the Environment. They actually work with the U.S. Catholic Conference, the the National Council of Churches, the Coalition on the Environment, and Jewish Life and the Evangelical Environmental Network. Five million dollar program. It was found funded by Ted Turner and other liberal foundations. It attempted to politicize, if you will, 100 million Americans in 53,000 congregations. Tom DeWeese, I believe is how you pronounce his name, he was the president of the American Policy Center. He said, It is unmistakably clear that the new partnership is the brainchild of anti-Christian New Age pagans who promote an environmental religion known as Gaia. The partnership sent education and action kits to 53,000 congregations. This actually included every Catholic parish and every Jewish synagogue in the United States. That's right. These kits, they included Sunday school and sermon resources that were planned to fit into the doctrine of that particular denomination. One of the pillars of the Temple of Understanding was a man this man's name was Maurice Strong. He was the Secretary General of the first UN Earth Summit. He called for half of the land in each of the 50 United States to be turned over so that it could become a wilderness area and that no one should be allowed to enter these areas. Think about that. This man was a millionaire. He was a proponent for one world government. This thing that everyone is going, to, going so crazy for. Everybody wants this. He owned a ranch in Colorado where he actually built a Babylonian sun god temple. Look it up. I kid you not. It serves as the center of New Age religious activity. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? When the church is raptured, where will everyone think that you and I have gone? I'm sure there will be a lot of confusion. I bet the entire government will be decimated but when, the ju when their own judges and their politicians, you know, the best and the brightest, are called into the air to be with the Lord. All those people that will be left behind, they'll be there, left there to defend for themselves. There will be no moral compass to guide them. Just by looking around, that whole governments will blame each other. They will claim that it was some secret weapon. <clears throat> then you have all these people that will point to uh, Nostradamus or maybe some other argument that maybe aliens came and took the people away. Then you'll have the New Age groups that have had long held beliefs in things like Quantum Leap. In spiritual evolution. Look at 
let's just look at some of these new age explanations for for you know events that defy explanation you know things that do not include God let's look at some of them number one expect much change to society whether yourself this needs not be negative but exciting leading to a new galactic civilization by the year 2012 that didn't happen did it number two time will seem to speed up the Mayan calendar says we're moving beyond time and beyond money <laughs> hmm that didn't happen there will be an official announcement <laughs> of contact with extraterrestrials in 1997, 1998. It said probably from the U.S. government. That didn't happen, did it? Number four. Earthquakes, eruptions will probably increase, but there will not be a massive rise in the water level. This is Mother Earth cleansing herself. <laughs> Number five, there will be much jockeying for power over the next few years between the military, the secret government, New World Order, Illuminati, Vatican, and some extraterrestrials. Number six, the banking system will probably collapse. The Mayan calendar says we're going beyond time and money. <laughs> that didn't happen. Number seven, the New World Order will attempt to be in power by 2003. This will probably be short-lived. We may wake up one day to the headlines that the banking system has collapsed. We each have $500 of credits units in a central system and we must use a smart card for all transactions well brothers and sisters it's 2022 did I miss that one number eight <laughs> there's a possibly a fake second coming meaning the return of Jesus staged by a negative gray extraterrestrial this could be an aerial hologram. This could be staged to divide us and distract us. The second coming is really within us. This one that I, I think they will actually use this when Jesus actually does appear in the sky. Because remember, everyone's going to see this. I think that one's one of the ones they're actually going to use. Um, number nine. Some people will be checking out due to their inability to handle the new higher spiritual frequencies of energies coming to our planet this will be their choice take note that this is a blatant false prophecy that was designed to explain away the, tr the rapture of the true church number 10 expect newly born children to be intelligent highly intuitive and spiritual leaders they actually use this one to try to say that kids with uh, autism are on a higher level that they're on they're on with uh, on the next mutation I've seen that one used a lot now did you notice like I did that as 2012 actually got closer and closer we actually kept hearing more and more and more about that Mayan calendar it became widespread it was a, a natural cycle calendar that they said uh, stimulated synchronicity and telepathy they actually believed that if they used that calendar that it would help them to heal the planet that it would you know break the link between time and money and, and that it would bring about uh, a oneness and an understanding now how many of you remember the story of WW higher source cult back in 1997 the whole world was shocked when they learned about this 39 members of this uh, you know Southern California cult that they committed suicide because they actually believed that they would be able to leave their bodies so that they could board this alien spaceship 
and, and they believed that the, this that this spaceship was following the Hellbop comet. I read where where someone said that when people stopped believing in God, they will start to believe in anything. And I believe that what happened with that cult uh, clearly illustrates that. Even witchcraft. Witchcraft was once a source of um, a lot of jokes. But now, here in the West, it's, it's on the rise again. I read where a group of witches won a, a court fight because they wanted to use this non-denominational um, New Hampshire cathedral as a meeting place. They won. They won on the basis of the fact that this nonprofit group that ran that cathedral allowed for a variety of religious groups to use it. And that meant that they were not allowed to discriminate against these witches. Ask, I've got to ask, where do we go from here? Well, as we enter this age that they're calling the New Age, an age where the religion of the ancient Babylon is, is going to come again, it's going to come forward, it's going to, reu it's going to reunify the world. Remember what I said about the ad on YouTube? They're saying maybe the old ways were right. Think about it. And then we have the worst thing that is out there. And that's these self-serving translations of the Bible. And this is and I want I want to take I want you to take with a word of caution what I'm going to say. There are cults out there that are tampering with the Bible so that they can promote their own doctrines. This should tell you how bad the teachings are. Because if you need to alter the Word of God, you should know that the belief is not authentic. We have some like the Mormons. The Mormons have the Joseph Smith translation. Then the other I can point out is that the Jehovah's Witness. They have their own version of the Bible. The Jehovah's Witness, they deny so many biblical doctrines, including the very deity of Christ and salvation by grace. They changed so much that they had to produce their own Bible, what they call the New World Translation. This is not, and I want to repeat, not a translation from the Hebrew or in Greek manuscript. It is self-serving. It's a perversion. If you can find one, I want you. If you can find one, and, and they're everywhere. I actually have one, um, and I was planning on showing it today, but I, I forgot it back in my uh, in my box. If you can find one, I want you to sit down with it and compare the two. You will see that there are many, and I do mean many, problems with it. Like I said, it's designed to promote and support their own heresies. Now, I have many people who follow me that are Catholic. I have a lot of Catholic friends and many Catholic followers. So, when you're watching this, please do not take what I'm about to say wrong. Do not take it as me bashing Catholicism. Just this particular translation. The Catholic Douay Bible. In its attempt to glorify Mary... It has long rendered a passage from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I'm going to actually take the time right now because I'm actually do, uh, writing a whole uh, series of sermons on Genesis in preparation for uh, when we get there. But let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
what does the Catholic Douay Bible say? It says, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Did you read? Did you did you just read with me in Genesis chapter three verse fifteen? Because the, the the Holy Bible makes it clear that it is the woman's seed that will crush the devil's head, not the woman. But you see, the Catholic Douay Bible has it so that it is Mary, and not Jesus who is presented as the one that will destroy Satan. And actually, if you can look in the Douay Bible, you will see in a marginal note that it actually says in, in art, Mary is frequently pictured with her foot on the head of the serpent. Take note as to how many, how much, I should say, of the stuff that, pe that a lot of these, these different translations, these false doctrinal teachings, change in their Bible prophecy. There's a famous individual who once said that the best lie contains just enough truth to make it palatable. Do you know who said that? That was Adolf Hitler. That's right. So, I want to thank you all for joining me here. It's been a pleasure, and I hope that uh, you took you uh, took what we were talking about here in the right spirit, <laughs> and know that uh, I, I'm, what I'm saying, I'm saying out of love and not hate towards anyone, towards any of these uh, false people who believe these false things. I actually hope that you watch this and you uh, learn, and that you're able to get away from these false doctrines, these false teachings, because it is only through Christ that you will find the truth. You'll find the true faith. You'll find grace. I love each and every one of you and I pray that you continue to join me here each and every Sunday. Um, I guess it's a pleasure and I love each and every one of you. May God continue to bless you and keep you and I will see you all here next week for an all new Sermons in the Park. Thank you and God bless you.